Peters and co-person at Odiaco. And thanks to Dr. Edith to join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Bach. So could I start off by asking for a show of hands as to how many people were here for the first lecture? OK, roughly half. Um, I'm not going to repeat the first lecture. Uh, but I do want to say that, that this lecture is quite different in that I'm switching disciplines tonight. My first lecture was in the discipline of political geography, which is not my discipline. So I was dipping my toe into a, another ocean. Um, and, and I felt the need to do that when I realized that um, when you look at both the Arctic and space, all of a sudden the Arctic takes on a third dimension, uh, in that the Arctic is connected uh, to space. Uh, through everything uh, from uh, the tilting of the planet as it orbits the sun, causing the seasons which make the Arctic what it is, to the intense reliance of Arctic people and peoples on satellites for communication, for Earth imaging, um, and, and putting that all together, the, the three-dimensional aspect came out and hit me in the face. And nothing in my two home disciplines of law or political science could deal with three dimensions. So I started reading Derek Gregory and Stuart Eldon and Philip Steinberg and other political geographers. And all of a sudden, I realized I had a lecture. Uh, that enabled me to, to connect these two regions in a, in a new way. Uh, that's not what I'm doing tonight. Uh, tonight's lecture is based upon an article that will be published next month in the journal Polar Record which is the Journal of the Scott Polar Research, in Research Institute at the University of Cambridge. It's still an interdisciplinary paper, which is why I'm publishing it in an interdisciplinary journal. Um, but it, it seeks to get at um, the, the question as to why Russia and Western countries, especially NATO countries, including the United States, are continuing to cooperate extensively in the Arctic and in space, despite the general breakdown in relations after the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. So what is it about these two regions that explains this continuing cooperation? And as you'll see, I, I wrote a paper on this that looked just at the Arctic as a single case study two years ago. Um, but by adding a second case study, namely space, I, I get some comparative leverage that I haven't had before. So that's where I'm going here. It's, it's, it's political science. Um, it's international relations. Um, and I'm trying to explain cooperation um, in the context of, of a more general breakdown of cooperation elsewhere. Now, I'm going to start with this picture, partly because I think it's a wonderful picture. This uh, was taken by the, the same um, young man who put together that video compilation that some of you have seen uh, about a SpaceX launch. This is my son, Cameron. Um, he took this picture three years ago uh, near the mouth of, of uh, Frobisher Bay. Um, and, and it's a ridiculously uh, satisfied polar bear who, who, who has just eaten four or 500 pounds of seal meat. Uh, that's all that's left. Um, and, and I've just had a, 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 a substantial dinner courtesy of Green College, so I'm feeling a little bit like this polar bear, which means that all of you are safe. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's also a way into my topic because in the early 1970s, 
the polar bear as a species was suddenly endangered by a technological development, namely the helicopter and the widespread availability of the helicopter to big game hunters. A polar bear on the ice, a hunter on the ice, a bear on the ice, you know, there's, there's some sort of equality of arms involved, right? These are big, powerful, well-camouflaged creatures that, that you know, are not vegetarians. Um, but, but from a helicopter or from an icebreaker, uh, they're easy targets. And the, the population of bears was plummeting around the Arctic. And on the advice of their scientists, the Soviet Union, the United States, Canada, Norway, and Denmark got together and adopted the Polar Bear Treaty. 1973, height of the Cold War, Polar Bear Treaty, in which they banned the use of helicopters and large vessels for the purposes of hunting polar bears. And the population around the Arctic rebounded to its, its previous level. So in the Arctic, in the middle of the Cold War, cooperation to save a, an iconic species that is revered in, in those five Arctic countries. This is 1982. This is the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. Now, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents. It's not like the Antarctic, which is a continent surrounded by oceans. The, the Arctic is an ocean, and the negotiation of UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Convention, in 1982 was, to a significant degree, about the Arctic. There were three countries that negotiated provisions that were central to the Arctic. The Soviet Union, the United States, and Canada, because a Canadian diplomat was the chair of the drafting committee, Alan Beasley. And so you find in, in UNCLOS, uh, you, you find 20 provisions on the exclusive economic zone, giving coastal countries rights to the water column and to seabed resources out to 200 nautical miles from shore. And you'll see in my next slide how important that is. There was a, a provision on extended continental shelves, the seabed beyond 200 nautical miles in places where the continental shelf goes further. And you'll see in the next slide how important that was. And there was a provision, Article 234, that's widely known as the Arctic Exception, which grants coastal states extensive pollution prevention jurisdiction in ice-covered waters, which was something that both Canada and the Soviet Union wanted very badly. So UNCLOS, seen through Arctic eyes, is an Arctic cooperation agreement. And I showed this slide in my first lecture this is what the Arctic looks like to international lawyers. The maritime zones of the Arctic are nicely divided out between the coastal countries. Now, there are a few delineation issues that need to be resolved, um, but 99% of the Arctic is unquestionably assigned to one or another of the coastal states under the law of the sea. And I say the law of the sea because that includes both the convention and the parallel rules of customary international law, which are accepted by the United States, even though it has not ratified the convention. Okay? But, but this is the Arctic, and you know, I explained it last week. You see all the incredible exclusive economic zones, particularly along the coast of Russia because of all, all their offshore islands. But, but look again at, at just how much exclusive economic zone belongs to Canada and Denmark, uh, the United States up there in the Beaufort and Church I see, uh, Norway here, and then in the middle you have the extended continental shelves with a process in the convention, a science-based process for determining where one country's jurisdiction ends and another country begins. So in the middle of the Cold War, 1982, um, the Arctic countries came together and, and did this. Remarkable. 
cooperation. 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev gave a, a, a speech at Murmansk where he described the Arctic as, quote, a zone of peace. A zone of peace. And he proposed a conference of the Arctic countries to coordinate their scientific research in the Arctic, which led to the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy in 1991 and to the Arctic Council in 1996. So this started during the Cold War, the end of the Cold War. And, and of course, this was one of the people who ended the Cold War. But other things were happening too in terms of Arctic cooperation. Take a look at this map. If you were trying to fly from Vancouver to Mumbai in the 1980s, it was a heck of a trip. Because if you were flying on a Western airline, you couldn't fly over Russia, China, Kazakhstan. Um, and, and, and Russia, of course, was the biggest impediment because it's the largest country in the world. Um, and in 1998, Russia opened up polar air routes over its territory to foreign commercial airlines. And see what happens now. You can fly from Vancouver to New Delhi, right? And, and on this map, that, that would not take you quite over the pole, but probably up to around 85 degrees. Uh, all of these routes opened up as cooperation in this region governed by international law because these are managed by the International Civil Aviation Organization, an international organization based in Montreal. So again, cooperation in the Arctic. I've already mentioned the, the Arctic Council created uh, in 1996 um, at a conference in, in Ottawa. Um, and, and the Arctic Council focuses on sustainable development, scientific cooperation, but has extended its, its reach uh, quite considerably uh, in the last uh, 22 and a half years. We'll, we'll come back to the Arctic Council. Interesting cooperation because it involves eight countries, one of which is Russia, and, and five of which are NATO states. And the working languages of the Arctic Council are English and Russian. Other stuff happened, quite remarkable, that not enough people know about. Uh, beginning in 2008, uh, Russia, the United States, and Canada um, began a, a, an annual exercise called Operation Vigilant Eagle. This is in international airspace, uh, over the Bering Sea. And the exercise involves a scenario where a civilian airliner has been hijacked. So these two planes in the front are Russian fighter jets. And those in the back, Paul, are those F F 15s or 18s? They're either CF 18s or they could be US Navy F 18s, but they're definitely NATO fighter jets. This is a cooperative exercise, again, taking place in the Arctic um, between Russia and, and Western states. And the amount of cooperation that, that, that's been taking place, that took place uh, in terms of search and rescue exercises, uh, in, in terms of meetings of various kinds, including at the security level, cooperation on um, the adoption of agreements uh, uh, initiated by the Arctic Council on uh, Arctic search and rescue, on oil spill preparedness and response, on uh, scientific cooperation. It just goes on and on, including in 2010, the resolution of the single largest Arctic sovereignty dispute in the Barents Sea between Russia and Norway. And they agreed to split the difference between their two claims. 2010. So, this is Russia we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And, and Norway has only got five million people, right? So this was not a, a, an equal negotiation in terms of standard measurements of power, but, but the cooperative spirit uh, was at work. So all good, cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. And then 
In March 2014, that thuggish looking little man in the middle, sorry, I don't like Vladimir Putin, um, but, but I'm a, a, a political scientist, so I can accept that he's a rational actor. Um, Mr. Putin signs the annexation of Crimea. So, what does that do to cooperation? Well, it, it stops most military cooperation. Not all, most. It doesn't stop the regular communications between the Norwegian military commander and the Russian military commander uh, with regards to their maritime boundary in the Barents Sea, because no one wants accidents to happen, right? It doesn't stop all military cooperation, it stops most military cooperation. Western countries adopt deep-reaching sanctions against Russia, travel bans, an arms embargo. Russia retaliates by banning food imports from the West. Right? This is pretty intense stuff, diplomatically. And, and, and again, this is happening in, in early 2014. And, and politicians are, are expressing um, their displeasure with each other in, in quite strong terms. So, surprise, surprise, apart from the military breakdown, Arctic cooperation continues. So this ship is the academic Sergei Vavilov, uh, which belongs to the Russian Academy of Sciences. It's a Russian government vessel. It's got a fabulous cafeteria. It's got great uh, cabins because it's um, chartered out to Arctic cruise companies uh, in the tourist season. And it was chartered by One Ocean Expeditions of uh, Squamish, uh, British Columbia, to serve as the mothership for the mission to find the lost vessels of the Franklin expedition. So this was August, September 2014. Just six months after the annexation of Crimea, a Russian government vessel is at the heart of the Canadian government mission to find the Franklin ships. And if you remember that summer, for some strange re reason, Stephen Harper did not go to the search location because he didn't want a journalist to snap a picture of him in front of a Russian government vessel in the middle of the Canadian Arctic. So the, the, so the, the, the public relations message was, we're very, very angry with, with, with Russia. But in actual reality, we like this ship, they've got a great crew, right? This is good, cooperation continues. Give you another example, in December 2014, this ship, which, is a, which was a South Korean fishing trawler with a crew of more than 50 people, uh, sank during a, a storm on the Russian side of the Bering Sea, quite close to the Russian coastline. Um, the first thing that Russian officials did when they learned that this ship had sunk and 50 men were in the water was to contact the U.S. Coast Guard in Dutch Harbor, Alaska. The U.S. Coast Guard immediately sent a Hercules spotter aircraft and two Coast Guard cutters, and six men were saved. So annexation of Korea in March, December of that year, human lives are at risk. Seamless cooperation. And it goes on. In uh, December 2014, so the same month, Denmark, which owns Greenland, made its submission to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, which is the United Nations body of scientists that reviews uh, the scientific basis for uh, coastal state rights over these extended continental shelves. And, and, and Denmark, uh, in a rather, well, formalistic, scientific way, followed the logic of the science in making a submission that included the entire Lomonosov Ridge across the middle of the Arctic Ocean, all the way across to the outer limit of the Russian exclusive economic zone. 
a certain Canadian professor named Michael Byers, <laughs> right, was telling journalists that this was stupidity of the highest order because how better to provoke Russia than to claim the entire Lomonosov Ridge? Why didn't the Danes hold off or hold back in their submission? Well, I was wrong, as I often am, because the very next day, the Russian Foreign Ministry issues a public statement in perfect English. Russia was well aware of the Danish side's plans. Our countries have cooperated actively, and they will continue to cooperate. The Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf should first confirm that the seabed sections to which Russia and Denmark are laying claims are part of the continental shelf, and then possible adjoining sections will be demarcated on a bilateral basis through negotiations and in line with international law. Russians said, no problem. So what, what I saw as a major provocation by Denmark had actually been discussed and planned in advance between those two countries, a NATO country and Russia, right? Seven months, no, nine months after the annexation of Crimea. They had it all sorted out. Well, we're following the rules, no problem. And a couple of years later, when Russia made its own submission, it, uh, it actually held back and did not claim the entire Lomonosov Ridge. Because as one of their diplomats told me, well, we're not going to get it all in the end anyway. So why should we follow the Danes and you know, go for the whole enchilada when we know it's going to be a compromise? This, this was remarkably responsible behavior. And, and again, I do not like Vladimir Putin, but this is, is responsible international behavior by the Russian Federation. And, and then in, in 2017, well, first starting in 2015, the, the five Arctic Ocean countries get together and negotiate an agreement on fisheries management in the central Arctic Ocean, beyond 200 nautical miles from shore, in, in international waters. And they say, in the continuance of scientific uncertainty as to the effects of climate change on fisheries here, we agree not to allow commercial fishing. They applied the precautionary principle. The, the five Arctic uh, countries, Arctic Ocean countries. And, and then two years later, they actually signed a binding treaty, not only among the five of them, but also Iceland, the European Union, Japan, South Korea, and China. 2017, seamless cooperation, Russia at the center of it. Applying the precautionary principle of international environmental law to fisheries. Who'd have thought? So that's the Arctic story. Lots of cooperation. Except in the military domain, but even in the military domain, no one's preparing to fight a war in the Arctic, right? Okay, space in 1957. This is, this is Sputnik. Uh, the beginning of the space race. Little tiny satellite in low Earth orbit broadcasting a beeping signal that shook the United States to its core. Because the Soviets were the, the first in, in space. But it wasn't a space race only in terms of technology. There was an awful lot of international cooperation that went on. So the very next year, 1958, the United Nations General Assembly creates the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. So again, Sputnik goes up in 57. Next year, you have a committee of the United Nations charged with the peaceful uses of outer space. Oh, and, and this country, Canada, was at the center of that. Um, because, as I explained in the last lecture, Canada was the third country in space just four years later in 1962. And uh, it went on, the cooperation. So in 1967, we have the Outer Space Treaty. 
This is a binding treaty developed through the United Nations, uh, negotiations led by the Soviet Union and the United States. It includes a prohibition on nuclear weapons in space. It asserts the freedom of exploration and use of space. It prohibits the national appropriation of the moon and other celestial bodies, which is why two years later, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin did not claim the moon for the United States. They, they planted a flag, but they did not claim the moon. And it includes, and this goes back to the South Korean fishing trawler, includes a duty to rescue and return astronauts in distress. 1967, Cold War. 1975, it's not a very good picture because it was taken in space in 1975. This is an American and this is a Soviet cosmonaut and they are shaking hands as a Soyuz capsule and an Apollo capsule meet and join in space. And the astronauts and the cosmonauts spent 20 hours together in space. This 1975 was the height of detente, a calming down of tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. So this was, was part of that. Um, but it was part of something broader also. So here's something that, that very few people know about. In 1979, the Soviet Union, the United States, France, and Canada created the Cosmos Sarsat program, which is a program that uses their different satellites to receive search and rescue di distress signals from the surface of the planet, and then to transmit the information about the precise location of the distress signal to the nearest search and rescue authority. So. The first rescue took place in 1982. So the first Soviet, the first satellite in the system was a Soviet satellite, a, a, a Cospas satellite. And it was sent up and it almost immediately picked up a signal from a beacon that had been set off by an airplane that crashed in northern Canada. The Soviet satellite relayed that distress signal to an experimental ground station in Ottawa, which called up the search and rescue authorities, probably in, in Yellowknife or Whitehorse, who went out and actually rescued the people in the crashed airplane. This system today serves more than 200 countries, saves over 4,000 lives each year. It's still operational. It's an international organization, COSPA SARSAT, and, and, and like the International Civil Aviation Organization, it, it's based in Montreal. So this was established again during the Cold War, cooperation in space, in this case to, again, save lives. During the same period, the spacefaring countries, particularly the Soviet Union and the United States, realized that, that things were becoming a little bit crowded in geostationary orbit, which is 35,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. But it's actually a fairly narrow zone because the idea is to put a satellite in a location where it uh, is essentially locked in place above a set point on the Earth's surface. This is why you can have satellite dishes for TV that, that you don't need to adjust. They always point it at the same place because they're pointed at a satellite, which is falling towards Earth, but also moving the same speed that the planet is turning. And, and, and so it's fixed in a sense, in a relative sense. Uh, and, and there are only a, a set number of places where you can put satellites particularly because satellites are transmitting and receiving. So someone needed to regulate the location of satellites and the frequencies, the radio frequencies they were using, so there wouldn't be, well, collisions or, or interference. 
And the spacefaring countries thought about this for a little bit and said, well, actually, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Um, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which started off as the International Telegraph Union, is an international organization that has been in existence for longer than the Dominion of Canada. It was created in 1865. And the ITU gradually took on this role of allocating slots and frequencies in geostationary orbit and does so to this day. And again, that happened because of the collective will of the Soviet Union uh, and Western countries. So moving past the Cold War, we have this. If you haven't seen the International Space Station yet, just go to the NASA website, find track the station, Enter Vancouver, British Columbia. It will tell you when to go outside. Really it's really bright because it's the size of a soccer field. Right? And all these solar arrays catch the sun's rays coming around the planet. So if it's after dark here, if it's evening and it's dark on the surface, this thing is still lit up like a giant Christmas tree in space. Right? Uh, it's big. And it's the result of 20 years of cooperation between Russia and the United States plus the European Space Agency plus the Canadian Space Agency. But, but it's a full partnership between Russia and the United States. And, and, and in 1998, when the United States um, was leading uh, this project, the creation of this project, and, and actually adopting an international treaty, the International Space Station Agreement, they made Russia the full partner with the United States. Even though the United States was paying 90% of the costs. Because there was an additional motive for international cooperation in this period, and that was keeping thousands of Russian rocket scientists and space engineers employed in Russia. So they didn't go and work for the North Koreans. Or, or the Pakistanis, right? So this was a kind of protective cooperation, but, but this is the result. Continued cooperation. Um, this is a, an Atlas V rocket, the, the rockets that are used to launch um, most of, of NASA's scientific satellites and almost all of the United States' military and intelligence satellites. It's powered with Russian-made engines, RD-180 engines. And in 2002, the United States recognized, first of all, the Russians build the best engines. And secondly, the only way we can keep those Russian scientists in Russia employed is to actually give them work. So let's buy engines. Um, and it's been a phenomenal partnership. So, so United Launch Alliance, uh, which, which builds and launches uh, these rockets is a joint venture of Lockheed Martin and Boeing. And they're using Russian-made rockets. Wow. The other thing that, that, uh, that happened, uh, and I showed this, this picture last week, but um, Western countries, space agencies, companies started purchasing launches for satellites on Russian rockets. Russians are really good at space, and in some cases they had leftover ICBMs, like this one, a SS-19 ICBM, repurposed into a satellite launcher. Um, and uh, these, these particular ro rockets were used to launch into sun-synchronous um, uh, polar orbit, carrying uh, Earth-observing satellites for the European Space Agency. Um, the Proton rockets uh, were um, launched from Baikonur to carry heavy geostationary satellites into orbit for Western and developing countries um, for satellite TV and internet. That was a joint venture um, that still to this day is based in Arlington, Virginia. Russian rockets, Virginia. These, these ones with, with the orange um, smoke, uh, the rockets are a partnership uh, between the Russians and uh, Aryan Space. 
owned by uh, essentially Airbus. Um, and the other uh, big uh, provider uh, is Arian Space, which is purchasing, so far, 41 Soyuz rockets to launch from French Guyana. So Russian-made Soyuz rockets launching for a Western European company in a French territory in South America. So lots of cooperation involving space. Wow, lots and lots of activity and with that, and I spoke about this last week, uh, space junk. This is a, a representation of, uh, of, of the literally millions of, of pieces of, of space junk uh, now in different Earth orbits. Uh, low Earth orbit uh, is particularly crowded. These are the result of over 5,000 orbital launches since 1957. Uh, so they're defunct satellites, they're, um, they're spent uh, rocket stages, and there's lots and lots of debris resulting from collisions. Uh, so that's a, a, a crowded area uh, now. Uh, the, the red dots here are just showing you where geostationary. That's geostationary orbit. Um, and, and this is a problem because um, there's enough of it now that we're starting to see collisions with functioning satellites. And a, a little speck of paint that's going 17,000 kilometers an hour can destroy a functioning satellite. And, and there's a worry about now a, a runaway phenomena uh, of, of once you get a, a certain amount of space debris, you have an escalating rate of collisions and, and quite potentially render at least low Earth orbit uh, unusable. So the point here is that, that countries are cooperating, including Russia. And information uh, about space debris um, and about uh, defunct satellites uh, has been shared for several decades now uh, with the United States military um, space surveillance network, which actually catalogs all of the space debris and then, because it's all computerized, is able to warn satellite operators of incoming debris. So the satellite can be moved out of the way using its thrusters. Just to give you an example here, the International Space Station in the last 20 years has been moved two dozen times because of incoming space debris. So, so cooperation in space. Um, and then, I really love this picture. <laughs> Nowhere else in the world can you get as close to a launching rocket as you can at Bakunur, Kazakhstan. Okay? <laughs> That, they're a kilometer away from a Soyuz launch, right? That's not the reason I'm showing you this. The reason I'm showing you this is there's a capsule on top that's going to the International Space Station that has at least one American on board. Because um, when the space shuttle program was shut down in 2011, after that, the only way to the, get to the International Space Station was on a, a Russian Soyuz from, from Bakunov. And so the United States and other Western space agencies, including the Canadian Space Agency, bought seats, just like buying seats on an airplane, to go to the ISS, which is why all Canadian astronauts speak fluent Russian. Right? They have to. They go through the Russian training to launch on Russian rockets to, to space. Wow, cooperation. It's not just in the Arctic, it, it's, it's in space. And then, of course, comes March 2014. These are Mr. Putin's little green men, which means that they're Russian soldiers who removed their insignia, thinking that this would fool people. <laughs> um, but of course, they're, they are um, engaged in a blatant violation of international law, violation of Article 2.4 of the Charter. And the response, again, was, was very powerful in terms of sanctions and travel bans and, uh, and the cessation of most military cooperation. Yeah? Well, that doesn't explain this. Everything continues in terms of space cooperation. Incidentally, uh, this astronaut here, who's a NASA astronaut, her name is Serena Chancellor, and she's going to be speaking at UBC next Wednesday as part of the Outer Space Institute. Um, she's the world's leading expert on the health risks involved with space travel. And she just got back from the ISS in December. So someone should ask her about what it was like as a 
flight surgeon who knows all about the health effects of space flight to have your return delayed twice. <laughs> when you know what that means for, for instance, your bone density, right, or your radiation dosage. But, but see, you've got a, a German, a Russian, and an American, and a Soyuz capsule. 2018. So that continued. This was just last week. This is one of those Russian Soyuz rockets that was bought by Arian Space, launching from French Guiana, carrying a collection of small communication satellites to low Earth orbit for a company called OneWeb that is hoping to replace cell phone towers worldwide with cell phone 5G broadband from space. It's happening, and, 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 and OneWeb's plan is to do all of their launches on Soyuz rockets from French Guiana over the course of the next decade or so. So, so cooperation continuing. You will have perhaps noticed that Prime Minister Trudeau announced a few days ago that Canada is going to be building a Canada arm for something called the Lunar Gateway. You might not have noticed because something else has been going on uh, in Ottawa. But, but the Prime Minister has been making a ton of announcements in the last week or so. Uh, all the ones he'd saved up for the election are now being like, rolled out. And, and, and this is one of them. Um, so when Donald Trump became President of the United States, one of the things he did was to redirect NASA from Mars towards the moon. Because he figures that they can get to the moon while he's still President. Uh, and, and so NASA came up with this plan for something called the Lunar Gateway, which the President thinks is about the moon, but is actually just a waypoint on the way to Mars. Okay? And, and, and Canada is going to build the arm, which won't be needed because SpaceX just demonstrated that you don't need arms to dock space capsules. But anyway, we're going to do this. We're going to build the arm. But what you don't know, and this is the point that's relevant to my lecture, is that the first thing NASA did when they got instructions from the president was to negotiate a cooperation agreement with Roscosmos, the Russian space agents, which is the essential partner in this. So 2017, right? After the annexation of Crimea, because you can't, well, I'll get to this, but you can't do space on your own. And the Russians are really good at it. But <laughs> cooperation continues on, on space debris. My wife is here, so I decided to use a tweet from a British astronaut, Tim Peake, um, who's tweeting in, in 2016 about, oh yeah, we get hit with space debris. This is the International Space Station, right? It didn't break through the window, right? Um, but that piece was probably a millimeter across, two millimeters across, right? It's a lot of space debris. And guess what? The Russians are still cooperating on space debris. Um, regardless of what's happened in, in Crimea or, or in Syria or elsewhere, this is endangering a project that is now as much theirs as it is the Americans. And they're cooperating on other stuff. Does anyone recognize this? Yeah, it's, it's like uh, Manakuagan. I, I've seen it from the air. It's absolutely stunning. It's roughly 70 kilometers across. Do you know what caused it? Meteorite. Meteorite. Yeah. This was a bad day for life on Earth. It didn't destroy life on Earth, but it was a bad day. Um, it was like many millions of years ago. Um, but but uh, uh, another meteorite, not quite this size, um, about a third of the size uh, struck Greenland 12,000 years ago. That would have been a civilization affecting strike. Um, and the, the asteroid Bennu, which is large enough to put an aircraft carrier inside, is going to pass between an Earth-Moon distance later in the next century. And, and the reason I'm telling you this is that after the annexation of Crimea, um, all of the space agencies of the different spacefaring countries created a new committee. It's called the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. 
So this is, this is the, the, they, are, they are actually planning the deep impact mission to stop the asteroid. And now it won't be Bruce Willis, but, but this is actually, it's, it's an issue that um, is, is, uh, involves some risk. We don't know how much risk yet, um, but the point is that, that Russia is cooperating with the United States and other Western countries on this issue right now, and they started doing this after the annexation of Crimea. And, and here's a little quote from that thuggish guy I referred to. Thank God this field of activity, space, is not being influenced by problems in politics, <laughs> since it is in the interest of everyone, in the interest of all humankind. And I could show you similar quotes from Putin about the Arctic and Arctic cooperation. So he clearly sees the Arctic and space as different. Okay, now, that's all the kind of intro. Um, I don't want to go on too much longer because I want to take some questions. But I have to do some analysis, right? That's just the story. The two parallel, remarkably similar stories. What's the relevance of that, okay? I haven't done political science yet tonight. I've just told you stories. So let's do some political science. I have identified what I, I think are eight different factors that contribute to ongoing international cooperation in the Arctic and space. Now, they, they, they are not all necessary factors, and, and, and therefore you could have cooperation perhaps with just five or six of them. Uh, and, they are overlapping to, to some degree, but I've identified eight different factors that, that seem to be playing a role here. And the first is that these are cold, dark, dangerous places. Okay? Just an illustration here. I, I took this picture in Lancaster Sound in uh, August 2011. Uh, this is an ice island uh, that broke off the Petersman Glacier of northern Greenland. Um, that's about, about 50 meters, so you can imagine how much ice is below the surface. Um, uh, it was calving off thousands, millions of pieces of glacial ice. So I was on an icebreaker. The icebreaker was sailing at two knots because there was so much glacial ice in the water. Very, very dangerous. Gale force winds. And the scientists wanted to put a satellite beacon on this ice island so they could track it from space. And by remarkable coincidence, we had an astronaut on board who's now the Governor General of Canada. And so the pilot and the chief scientist and Julie Payette flew across to this ice island in gale force winds uh, in the middle of very dangerous waters and the water temperature was probably just below zero degrees Celsius. It, it's salt water. It takes more than that to, to freeze. It was actually a fairly dangerous mission. And I remember the captain of the icebreaker looking the pilot in the eye saying, are you sure this is safe? And he wanted the pilot to do that last sort of second thought moment. That helicopter, two years later, crashed into McClure Strait in the Western Arctic, and three people lost their lives, froze to death before the ship could get to them. So it's dangerous. Space is even more dangerous, right? Because if you go outside, you die, right? Um, and you're not protected by our wonderfully benevolent atmosphere under which we've evolved, right? So we've got protection against all kinds of, of, of bad things. Uh, and then we have a magnetic uh, field around the planet, which is also quite useful in warding off a lot of radiation. So it's even worse. You die. And, and part of my theory is that, 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 that these incredible risks, combined with the remoteness and the incredible expense of operating in these regions, force countries to cooperate. Force them to cooperate. At the level of technology, at the level of rocket launches, you couldn't have built the International Space Station without Russian proton rockets. You could not have done it. The United States could not have done it. Right? Um, just the, the, the COSPA SARSAT system, those search and rescue satellites, you could not have that system operate without, without ground stations in Russia. 
without, without Soviet satellites contributing to the system. It, you, you, you could do a partial system, but it would be slower, and people would die. So cold, dark, and dangerous forces cooperation is, is my first factor. The second factor is that, that remarkably, both the Arctic and space are militarized but not weaponized. So there, there's a lot of military activity that's taken place in the Arctic, most of it going through the Arctic. Russian and American bombers preparing to fly over the Arctic to deliver nuclear weapons. ICBMs prepared to fly over the Arctic through space to deliver nuclear weapons. And supporting infrastructure, runways, radar stations. Today, 2019, during a crisis with Russia, there are only 200 Canadian Forces personnel stationed in the 40% of this country that's Arctic. We're not preparing to fight a war in the Arctic. Walter Natinchuk, the former chief of the Canadian Defense Staff, once joked that if someone were to invade the Canadian Arctic, his first job would be to rescue them. <laughs> It's big, it's dangerous, it's expensive. Vladimir Putin has got enough going on in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. He's fully extended. He doesn't want to prepare for war in the Arctic. He's got to deal with melting sea ice and increased activity and a constabulary capacity that needs to be rebuilt. But he's not planning a war in the Arctic. Nobody is. And that's part of it. And it's remarkable. Militarized but not weaponized. That makes cooperation easier. Right? It's more difficult to, to cooperate with someone if they're preparing to fight you. And it's the same in space. Right? The, these Earth orbits are intensely militarized. Roughly a third of the satellites in Earth orbit are military and intelligence satellites. Right? Modern militaries run from space. It's communications. You can't fly a Raptor drone without broadband from space. Can't do it. Can't fly an F-35 to its full capacity without broadband from space. You, you can't do situational awareness. You can't do targeting. Right? Precision guided bombs and missiles, they're all guided by GPS, which is based in mid-Earth orbit on more than 30 satellites. And it's the same on the Russian and the Chinese side. Everyone is dependent on space. But not in terms of weapons in space. There, there may be a few anti-satellite weapons in space that we don't know about. That's conceivable. But nobody is overtly weaponizing space. You can use ground-based missiles to target space, to target satellites. The Chinese did it in 2007, right? But, but it's not... That, when, when Donald Trump talks about Space Force and probably envisages Imperial stormtroopers flying around, right? That is the furthest thing from reality. The day that he actually signed the directive for a U.S. Space Force... Well, sorry, the day he announced the U.S. Space Force, he signed a directive that wasn't about the Space Force at all. It was about a mandate to all U.S. government departments and agencies to cooperate with other countries on space debris and the prevention of space debris. He doesn't read. He had no idea what he was signing. He, he, he was told it was about space and he started to just freelance about a space force, right? No, no, it's, it's both regions are remarkable in that they are militarized but not weaponized. And, and I'll, I want to say two things about this. In, in space, at least, part of the reason is that Satellites are incredibly vulnerable. They're very fragile. You have to launch them. They're very light. And they fly on predictable paths. They are incredibly vulnerable to being struck, including by ground-based missiles. And so the different spacefaring countries exist in a situation of mutually assured destruction when it comes to satellites, particularly because of the risk of runaway space debris. Anyone starts targeting other countries' satellites, they could lose their own satellites through the debris that was created. Because the debris disperses in those orbits. 
And so there's this incredible restraint driven by this mutually assured destruction. But there may be something else going on too, which I think is really interesting. Way back in 1950, a, a political scientist named John Hertz identified a concept called the security dilemma, whereby countries feel a pressure to build up their militaries because of uncertainty about what their potential opponents are doing. So the, the, the low risk approach is to build up if you don't know what the other guys are doing. Right? They might not be doing anything. They might be disarming, but you don't know. So you assume that, that they have belligerent goals. And, and so you build up and then they see you building up and so they build up in response and you get a, an arms race through this lack of certainty, lack of knowledge about what is really going on. Well, in the Arctic and space, you don't necessarily have this problem. Thanks to space-based technologies, we can see everything that's happening in the Russian Arctic. There are no trees. There are almost no buildings. Right? You, you, you can actually detect the wake of a submerged submarine using a synthetic aperture radar satellite. Right? We know exactly what's going on in the Russian Arctic. They know exactly what's going on in the Canadian and the American Arctic because it is, is such a, a hostile, open environment to that kind of surveillance. And it's the same thing in space. Every time that a military launches a top secret satellite, right? There's a contest among thousands of amateur astronomers around the world who've got medium-sized telescopes to be the first to identify its precise orbit. Right? So even when, when the National Reconnaissance Office launches a, 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 a secret satellite on top of an Atlas V or a, or, or a SpaceX uh, Falcon 9, and the, the, the actual broadcast terminates after about 90 seconds because it's top secret, and then 30 seconds later, someone goes out on Reddit and says, got it, okay? So, so the security dilemma pretty much disappears. Other stuff is going on, and again, I, I'm conscious of time here, but there are tragedies of the commons in, in both the Arctic and space. Um, persistent organic pollutants um, actually effectively addressed through the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, partly because of Inuit involvement. And this was a sculpture of a, a Nook woman um, nursing her child that, that Sheila Watt-Cloutier put on the negotiating table um, at the United Nations Environmental Program to, to get that agreement, which is actually showing real results. But it was a tragedy of commons. Persistent organic pollutants uh, produced around the world being carried to the Arctic. Uh, another example is mercury. The Miyamata Convention uh, is, is a serious effort to deal with, with mercury and, and mercury transmission uh, to the Arctic. Chlorofluorocarbons, um, the ozone layer, a bigger issue in the Antarctic, but also an issue in the Arctic and being dealt with more or less effectively through um, the, the Montreal Protocol. Carbon dioxide, not so much, um, although in the Arctic, there is cooperation with regards to black carbon, which is a, a, a short-term climate forcer that accelerates the effects of climate change because the, the soot that comes from diesel uh, engines or, or heavy fuel oil lands on ice or snow and accelerates the, the melting. So, so there are tragedies of the commons in the Arctic and they're, they're being addressed because they affect everyone, right? This is Richard Harden, right? the environmental Challenges that can only be solved by all affected people pulling together with no free riders. It's in the Arctic and it's in space because of space debris. Low Earth orbit is a tragedy of the commons and it's being dealt with to some degree now through cooperation, including Russian and Chinese cooperation. So that's part of it. Uh, another thing is, is international law. I've, I've spoken a bit about this today. Uh, the, the, the density of international lawmaking in these two regions is, is really impressive. Um, starting with um, the Outer Space Treaty in, in 1967 and the Law of the Sea Convention in 1982, but it just builds on that. Very densely regulated by international law, both hard law and what's called soft law. Soft law is easier to negotiate because it's not technically binding, but if countries follow it, it it's just as effective. And, and, and so it guides cooperation provides um, 
stability and, and, and predictability. Um, so I, I turn this risk management through international lawmaking. Russia and other Arctic countries are trying to stabilize and make their relations more predictable by entering into regionally specific treaties and non-binding agreements um, that, that, that give them some assurance as to, as to behavior in the future. It's, it's an intensely legalized area. I think that, that in turn can generate more cooperation. Right? It becomes a sort of virtuous circle. We, we've created these treaties and these agreements and oh my gosh, we're following them. Well, let's do some more, particularly if the people who negotiated them are available to negotiate the next set. So you get these relationships that build so-called epistemic communities. So there's that factor. Another factor which is interesting is that a lot of the decision making that takes place in both the Arctic and in space is consensus decision making. This is the Arctic Council meeting in the Legislative Assembly in, uh, in Iqaluit. Uh, so this would be 2015. Curiously enough, a year after the annexation of Crimea, Arctic Council's functioning perfectly in Iqaluit. Stephen Harper's Prime Minister, the Russians are there. Okay? But it's consensus decision making. So they don't vote. Right? They, they all negotiate until they agree. Um, and that means that there are no decisions taken against the strong interests of any particular state. A consensus is essentially a veto to all the involved countries. So they have to come to an agreement. And that protects the interests of Russia. And Russia has a veto at the United Nations Security Council, which is why it attends every single meeting. Right? Because it has a veto? Well, Russia effectively has a veto at the Arctic Council, which is why it attends every single meeting. And while it's there, well, it might as well cooperate and get some productive stuff done. So I think consensus decision making is part of this. Um, it, it, it's not like a voting situation. It's, it, it's different. It, it promotes collaboration. And then related to that is, is again, this soft law I've been talking about. The Arctic Council is the result of a declaration. There's no founding treaty for the Arctic Council. And none of the documents adopted by the Arctic Council are hard law. They, they initiated the negotiation of three treaties, but those aren't Arctic Council treaties. Everything that comes out of the Arctic Council itself is soft law. And, and I think this is important because soft law doesn't carry the same weight in terms of, of enforceability and therefore threat, right? If it works for you, if it works for everyone, you follow it. It guides, it predicts, it stabilizes. But it's easier to get to yes when you're negotiating something that, at least formally speaking, is non-binding. Another factor I've already written about, this is the paper I did just on the Arctic. I went back and, and resurrected a, a concept from 1978 that had been uh, developed by Bob Cohen and, and Joe Nye, two leading American uh, international relations scholars called Complex Interdependence, where they, they basically said that in some regions or issue areas, if you get to a certain level of multiple interactions, relations, actors, governmental, non-governmental actors, if you have a certain density of relations, you, you end up seeing some different things happening. So in a dense interdependent relationship, military security is not the primary issue anymore. It, 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 it falls into a, a level of equilibrium with other issues. And, and most importantly, this is what I seized upon. They identify that if you have a, an intensely interdependent relationship in a particular region or issue area, it gets separated off from other regions or issue areas. And my value added in this paper, and I actually did check with Cohen about this, my value added was to say that this separability can actually preserve cooperation in that region or issue area despite a general breakdown in relations elsewhere. So in an international crisis, like the one resulting from the annexation of Crimea, these dense relationships can keep things going in a place like the Arctic. Well, guess what? I now think I've found the same thing in space. So it's a combination of all these different things. And, and then one final twist, because the, the problem with my argument up to this point was that I haven't been talking much about China. 
right? And China is not an Arctic country, although it has Arctic capabilities. It is a serious spacefaring country. It has launched astronauts to space. It does just as many launches as SpaceX does. It's a very serious spacefaring country. It's not a member of the Arctic Council. It applied for observer status and was told to wait for six years while the Arctic states crafted criteria for observers. So it entered as an observer on their terms. It wasn't party to that initial agreement on Central Arctic Ocean fisheries. The Arctic countries did the agreement first and then opened it up to China. In space, NASA is not allowed to cooperate with the Chinese Space Agency because of an act of Congress. The worry was technology theft. Uh, and, and China is not, therefore, a partner in the International Space Station, nor at the moment will it be involved in the Lunar Gateway. And, and even the Russians are hesitant to cooperate with China in, in not only the Arctic, but in space. China desperately wants to buy the technology for those Russian rocket engines, the RD-180s. Russia won't sell them. They'll sell the engines, not the technology. Uh, so my theory here is that, that as the original leading Arctic and space countries, the two traditional superpowers have a common interest in holding China down. They can't prevent China from being involved in the Arctic and space, but they can restrain its growth in those regions. And that, that common interest in keeping China out brings Russia and the United States together. Why do you think Russia and the United States and Canada and Norway and Denmark all love these extended continental shelves? because that keeps China out of the Arctic, right? China can't access resources in the Arctic in the seabed because, well, they're all assigned to the coastal states through the law of the sea convention that, that Russia has been following to the letter, just as they follow the space treaties, more or less to the letter, perhaps for the same reason. So, that's the, the paper I've gone, I've gone over time, um, but my modest contribution to the literature on international relations in this paper is that, well, these are the factors first I've identified, and so my modest contribution is here. The more that states need to cooperate, cold, dark, and dangerous, in a particular region or issue area, and the more they become accustomed <coughs> to doing so, right? We're talking about decades and decades of cooperation, right? the more resilient that cooperation becomes to tensions and breakdowns elsewhere. So just for fun, earlier today I decided to come up with my own term, uh, which is complex and resilient interdependence. Again, the resilience not being something that appeared in, in Cohen and Nye's work on complex interdependence. That's the technical international relations side of this. But I also think it's just a really cool story of two parallel regions where Russia and the West are getting along. That's the talk. I think we have a few minutes, perhaps. I don't know. I'm looking at Mark. Why don't we do a quick 15 or 20 minutes of discussion, and then I want to actually suggest that anyone who wants to continue the discussion comes to the graduate pub, Kerner's Pub, because due to a miscommunication earlier today,